In today's video, we're going to be solving 2022 AP Biology FRQ number one. So let's begin. Hi everyone, my name is Mikey from Able Prep Academy and you're joining us here today to solve a problem together. It's an FRQ from the 2022 exam, which deals with chapter 11 and a little bit of chapter seven. And this is great because it's November right now, starting to get a little bit cold, and that means it's about time for that unit four exam at your school. So if you haven't taken that test yet, then hopefully this video will help you. And just before we get started, if you haven't done so already, consider subscribing to our channel if you're interested in more content for AP Biology. Now, let's begin with the question. In 2022, the first question dealt with a very familiar picture. It's about a G-protein coupled receptor, which if you remember from chapter 11, was a receptor type that allowed the ligand to activate a G-protein, which typically activated subsequent proteins within the cell's intracellular signaling pathway. So let's take a look at what they say. It says the binding of an extracellular ligand to a G-protein coupled receptor in the plasma membrane of a cell triggers intracellular signaling. After the ligand binding, GTP replaces GDP that is bound to G subunit alpha, a subunit of the G protein. Here we have the GDP falling out and GTP activating our alpha subunit. And it goes to say that this causes the G subunit alpha to activate other cell proteins, including adenylocyclase that converts ATP to cyclic AMP. So that means that as this G subunit alpha activates our adenylocyclase, it will then convert ATP into cyclic AMP. Now it goes on to say that the cyclic AMP activates protein kinases. Okay, and there we go, protein kinases becoming active. And it says in cells that line the small intestine, a cyclic AMP activated protein kinase causes further signaling that ultimately results in the secretion of chloride ions from the cells. Under normal conditions, the G subunit alpha hydrolyzes GTP to GDP so hopefully everything returns back to normal here, thus inactivating adenylcyclase and stopping the signal. And that is one of the most important things. Remember that in AP biology, we don't only want to know how something is turned on, but we also want to know how it's regulated by either its ability to naturally turn off by itself, or perhaps there's an inhibitor or some sort of a antagonistic molecule that is going to undo something that you've done. And in this case, GTP is supposed to just simply naturally turn back to GDP, hopefully stopping the signal from causing over excessive conversion of ATP into cyclic AMP. Now let's take a look at how they're going to incorporate this into something that's kind of interesting here. It says, individuals infected with the bacterium Vibrio cholerae experience severe loss of water from the body, dehydration. Now they say dehydration, but this is really diarrhea. This is due to the effects of bacterial cholera toxin that enters the intestinal cells. Scientists study the effects of cholera toxin on four samples of isolated intestinal cell membranes containing the G-protein-related signal transduction components shown in figure one. GTP was added to samples two and four only. Cholera toxin was added to samples three and four only. And we'll see a table for this, so if this isn't making too much sense by reading, uh, you'll see it very shortly. And it says the scientists then measure the amount of cyclic AMP produced by adenocyclase in each sample. And as I mentioned, this is the table that we're focusing on. As you can see, sample one over here has neither GTP nor cholera toxin. Sample two has both GTP, uh, I'm sorry, sample two has only GTP, but no cholera toxin. Sample three has no GTP, but cholera toxin. And sample four has both GTP and cholera toxin. Guys, the dependent variable that we're trying to measure here is of course, over on the right side, the rate of cyclic AMP production, which you see as being extremely high where there is cholera toxin as well as GTP. And of course, if you don't have GTP, then it's going to be relatively low. I would say that sample two over here is sort of the status quo. When you're not supposed to have any toxin in your body, but you are supposed to have GTP, then it should be producing something along the lines of 10 picomoles per milligram of adenocyclase per minute in terms of the rate of cyclic AMP production. Now guys, I wanna pause here for a second and talk to you guys a little bit about what you need to know for the context of this particular question. Now, first and foremost, the AP Biology doesn't expect you to know a lot about physiology. However, you should know what these intestinal cells are supposed to do. Um, from physiology, we learn that intestinal cells typically will absorb nutrients and reabsorb water as to create the fecal matter that goes out of your body. 
However, for this question, when they say that the infected individuals have cholera, then it does help to know a little bit about how cholera affects your body. As you may have heard, cholera has caused multiple pandemics throughout our history, and one of the distinguishing features of being infected with cholera is a lot of loss of water due to diarrhea causing dehydration. Now, this is a devastating disease which can be cured by antibiotics but is still a problem in many parts of the world. So whatever they are trying to tell us with the cyclic AMP, I'm sure it's going to be related with the idea of chloride ion loss from the cell, which will presumably cause sodium ions to follow the chloride ions and therefore causing a water loss from the cell as the cell loses water to the outside environment. And that is something that, you know, may not be so obvious at the beginning, but hopefully as you solve through this question, the sub questions may actually lead you to those conclusions. So let's go ahead and tackle the problems. A says, describe one characteristic of a membrane that requires a channel to be present for chloride ions to passively cross the membrane. Explain why the movement of chloride ions out of the cell likely leads to water loss. So here I will say that this is straight out of chapter 7. First and foremost, we know that chloride ions are negatively charged. And if you don't know that, just look at the drawing because it literally tells you that chloride ions are charged. And what we know about charged substances is that they don't like to pass through the phospholipid bilayer. And the reason for this is that as I'm drawing the phospholipid bilayer right now, we have learned that the phospholipid bilayer has a non-polar lipid region in between. And as such, polar or charged substances like chloride ions are not going to want to cross through the nonpolar area, even if it's moving from an area of high to low concentration. So in this case, the best description of that cell membrane would be talking about the amphipathic nature of phospholipids and the fact that they form a bilayer with a nonpolar region in the middle so that the charged substance like chloride ions cannot pass through. Now, when they ask, explain why the movement of chloride ions cause the water loss? Well, there's a couple of ways that we can think about this. I believe the technical truth of the matter here is that as chloride ions leave, sodium ions follow because of the charge differential. But even if we don't know about sodium ions leaving, what we know is that we are now losing more solutes to the outside of the cell. So if we start off with an isotonic condition between the cell and the outside environment, but now we have chloride ions that are diffusing outwards, then clearly we're causing the outside to become slightly more hypertonic, meaning that osmosis will drive water out of the cell to the outside. So part A of this question is not really about the signaling pathway itself, but more about chapter seven. But let's take a look at B. It says, identify an independent variable in the experiment. Identify a negative control. Justify why the scientists included sample three as a control treatment in the experiment. So this is very typical of AP Biology. If they give you real data to work with, like what we see here, then they might ask you to identify dependent, independent, negative, positive controls, and so on. So the independent variable, as you guys may remember, are the variables that we establish in order to see how that may affect some result, which we call the dependent variable. So if I go back to this chart over here, and I'm gonna clear this out a little bit, what we know is that we were able to control whether these cells had GTP or whether they had cholera toxin. So both GTP and cholera toxins, presence or absence, would be possible for the independent variable that's being asked here. And of course, the dependent variable would be the rate of cyclic AMP production. Now, identify a negative control of the experiment. Well, the negative control will be something like sample one, because, well, this is the more obvious one anyway. Sample one here neither contains GTP nor cholera toxin. Negative controls are typically used to show that the presence of either GTP or the cholera toxin is going to have some impact on the dependent variable, such that in the absence of either one of these or both, that you may not see the results that you expect to see. What this does is that it truly isolates either GTP or cholera or simultaneously GTP and cholera as the leading cause of the dependent variable changes that we observe in the experiment. So in this case, I would go with sample one, but even sample two and three could be negative controls with respect to the cholera toxin and the GTP respectively. Now, the last part of this B says, justify why the scientists included sample three as a control treatment in the experiment. Now, control three, I'm sorry, the sample three, as you can see, has 
no GTP, but cholera toxin. And what we're able to do with sample three is to compare that against sample four because sample four contains GTP. What this means is that the cholera toxin in the absence of GTP does not actually cause a lot of increase in cyclic AMP production, meaning that we can isolate the presence of GTP or the GTP molecule itself as being a critical component of what's driving this change from 0.5 picomoles to 127 picomoles. So hopefully you can articulate that in your answer, but if it's hard to do, then there is another link in the description that contains the answer key for this FRQ. Let's move on to C here. C says, based on the data, describe the effect of the cholera toxin on the synthesis of cyclic AMP and calculate the percent change in the rate of cyclic AMP production due to the presence of cholera toxin in sample four. Now let's start with the first part. Based on the data, describe the effect of cholera toxin on the synthesis of cyclic AMP. Now, what we do here is going back to this table, we're really going to compare this sample two and this sample four because we want to make sure that both cells have GTP and the only difference is really with the presence of the cholera toxin. So in the description of this answer, I would say that comparing samples two and four, we know that the presence of cholera toxin substantially increases the amount of cyclic AMP production from 10 all the way to 127 picomoles. Remember that it's really good to use data when you're answering these questions. So you can do that for the first part. Now the second part says calculate the percent change. It's going to be 127 minus 10 divided by 10 multiplied by 100 to give us that percentage. I'll do this math right now. A few moments later. Okay, so the math turns out to be 1,170%, which means it's about 12 times higher than it's supposed to be normally. And as you can see from 10 to 127, that sounds about right as well. Now let's tackle the last part of this question. It says a drug is designed to bind to cholera toxin before it crosses the intestinal cell membrane. Scientists mix the drug with cholera toxin and then add this mixture and GTP to a sample of intestinal cell membranes. Okay, so, so far we have this description that a drug is able to bind to the cholera toxin. Now when I hear this binding, to me, this means deactivating. Because remember that when something binds to a substance, it no longer has the same structure, therefore it probably impacts its function. Now, it says predict the rate of cyclic AMP production in picomoles per milligram adenocyclate per minute if the drug binds to all of the toxin. So if the drug binds to 100% of the toxin, then it may as well not even be there. So then we channel this sample two yet again and say, look, in the absence of cholera toxin, which is exactly what's happening now, what would the rate be? And that would be 10 picomoles per milligram of adenocyclase per minute, and that will be good enough. Now it says, in a separate experiment, scientists engineer a mutant adenocyclase that cannot be activated by the G subunit A. The scientists claim that cholera toxin will not cause excessive water loss from the whole intestinal cells that contain the mutant adenocyclase justify this claim. So for this answer, I should give you a little bit more background on exactly what's happening with the cholera toxin. In literature, what we see is that the cholera toxin affects the G subunit alpha in such a way that it makes it nearly impossible for that GTP to be rehydrolyzed back into GDP, thereby deactivating the G subunit A, which means that the G subunit A always has a GTP attached to it, and as a result, it will always activate adenocyclase, which will then create an abundant amount of cyclic AMP, which will then create additional loss of chloride ions from the cell, which then results in diarrhea. So that's a huge chain of events, but that's exactly how this is supposed to be working out. So in this question, when they say that they're going to create a mutant adenylocyclase that is not gonna be responsive to G subunit A, then whether that G subunit A is active or not is not gonna have any impact on the amount of cyclic AMP production. And what that means is that the cyclic AMP will not actually be produced in abundant amounts if at all, which means that it's not likely to cause water loss from the intestinal cells, meaning that the scientists were actually right and their claim is justified. So that about sums up this question. But as you can see from this example, many of the AP Biology FRQ involve multiple chapters that must be synthesized together in tackling a single question. And furthermore, there are a lot of experimental questions that you wanna be familiar with. So if you're at a school where your teacher makes you do a lot of lab reports, then you're gonna be ahead of the game. But if you're not, then be sure to understand what controls are, what variables 
are and especially independent and dependent variables and make sure that you understand how to read data tables correctly because that's going to play a big role in solving these questions successfully. If this video has been helpful, then click the like button so we know what kind of content that you guys enjoy. And I'm hoping to make a lot more solid videos in the future. This has been Mikey with Able Prep Academy. We'll see you in the next video. Take care. Thank you.